Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Bruce. And I'm Josh, and we're your farm management hosts. Let's get started. Josh, it's summertime, and it got me thinking about past summer jobs and just generating money for college and other things that I needed, car and other necessities. What kind of summer jobs did you have growing up? Bruce, thinking back to high school. High school, my first job, my dad working on the farm, he also decided to have a pet crematory. So I worked with my dad for the pet crematory all throughout high school. So my job was just to go and pick up animals from vets and bring them over. Once I went to college, I had some internships where I worked at a summer camp. I've worked over at a grain marketing place. When I graduated college, I actually graduated when COVID started, so there's no job. So I work for a delivery service and looking at these summer days, looking at where it's hot outside, I do not envy anyone working in a delivery service right now. I know the back of those trucks, they get really hot. I think I clocked one once and it was like 160 degrees. So, you know, I do not envy working in any of those delivery services, but those are some of my summer jobs I had growing up. What about you, Bruce? Well, I was on the farm for several of my younger years, I guess, and it wasn't until I went off to college, like I mentioned, but worked at a manufacturing factory, uh, great money, uh, worked second shift. And there's people that either prefer, of course, first shift and third shift. Third shift is kind of a kind of human being of their own. They're built with a different set of studs than maybe the rest of it. But second shift can be tough because you're in that prime afternoon and evening that you're at work and you kind of have a tendency to miss out. The reason I liked working second shift is because we got a shift premium. We got paid more to work second shift. So so I worked a three to 11, good money, generated enough to get the things essential for college and transportation type stuff. So all in all, very good. So I guess, Josh, you know, we're going to talk about labor today. We have none other than Jeff Lewis, Ohio State University Extension Ag Law Resource Expert. We're going to refer to him today. And it's just because... The topic is so important when hiring labor on the farm and in other businesses, to be honest, there are some, maybe some pitfalls that we want to help people avoid, but at the same time, learn about how to hire labor the right way. And so Jeff, thanks for being our guest today. And uh, would you like to give us a little bit more of an official background about your position and your experiences? Yeah. Thank you guys for having me today. As Bruce said, Jeff Lewis, I have been with Ohio State Extension for, I think, coming up four years now. I started out with Peggy Hall in the Ag Law Resource Program, and I was a research specialist, focused a lot on labor and employment, which I got my desire and passion for labor and employment because of Peggy. We did a big project, and we're still working on it right now, doing some labor and employment guides for agriculture. I transitioned over to the OSU Income Tax Schools as a program coordinator and attorney, and I work with Barry Ward there, and we do a lot of teaching on tax updates, federal tax updates, state tax updates, and also the agricultural exemptions that apply. And my background as an attorney is I started off as a litigator for an insurance defense firm in Columbus, and then I transitioned over and worked with Peggy and now Barry and have been in all facets of business law in some way, it seems. So I started off defending businesses. I defended veterinarians when they were being sued. And then I've transitioned over into the transactional space, some contracts, labor and employment, and tax issues. And such a need for those subject matters there. And so as we look at agriculture today, there is such a business side of what we do in agriculture, whether that's following policy, rules, laws, and so on. And farming is labor intensive at certain times of the year, require extra hands, extra people to do certain things. So let's say today I'm looking, Jeff, to hire someone to perform some of that work on the farm. What is the first thing I need to know? Well, I think the first thing we need to know is whether or not you're hiring an employee or an independent contractor. I think making that classification is probably one of the most important steps when you hire someone to come to your farm and do some work. Because if you hire an employee, there are certain federal and state laws and regulations that are triggered. You have state labor laws, federal labor laws, state and federal tax laws, and some other federal and state regulations like OSHA and stuff like that. So if you have an employee coming onto your farm, you know that you're going to have those compliance issues and, you know, it is kind of a headache. There is a lot to deal with there. But if you hire an independent contractor, you don't have to deal with so many issues. 
you know, you have a W-9 filled out, you send a 1099 by January 31st of the next year, and you're pretty much done with your record keeping requirements and stuff like that. But I think in agriculture, especially, we have the tendency to believe that everybody we're bringing onto the farm might be an independent contractor, or at least we hope they are, because we want to avoid those issues. But it can really be damaging to a business, to a farm, to misclassify a worker as an employee or independent contractor. So let's go back to that, Jeff, just a little bit. How do we know if a worker should be classified as an independent contractor or as an employee? Good question. And this is going to be a long answer. So with state and federal law, there are two avenues that you have to follow as an employer or independent contractor, whatever the situation might be. But the two avenues you have to follow are both state and federal law. So federally, we have two tests that I like to focus on being labor and employment and tax focused. The first test is the Department of Labor test, which is for wage and hour purposes and determining and defining employee. And then the second test that I focus a lot on is the Internal Revenue Service test or the IRS. And they just have a slightly different test for taxation purposes, whether or not you should be withholding federal income tax, Medicare, and stuff like that. So the tests, like I said, are not identical, but they are so similar that if you have found that someone is an independent contractor under one test, you probably will find that it's an independent contractor under the other. And now for Ohio, we also have two different tests that we use. For wage and hour purposes, we follow the same law as the Department of Labor. So we're going to use that economic realities test. But for Ohio's unemployment insurance tax, the workers' compensation issues, and Ohio tort law, which is really important, I want to address that here in a little bit, we use a right to control test. So if you're not in Ohio, you want to make sure that your state isn't using separate tests to determine who is and who is not an independent contractor. And although these might seem like they're competing against each other, and they are, you have to remember that federal law reigns supreme, right? So federal law is king until it isn't. And when is it not king? In the labor and employment world, it's when the better protections are given by state law or federal law. So whichever law provides the most protection, the most benefit to a worker, that's the law you want to follow. And so all of this has culminated into what we have now in the beginning of 2024, the Department of Labor has actually introduced a new rule for determining an independent contractor. And it's called the Economic Realities Test, and it's a totality of the circumstances approach. So this totality of the circumstances approach is where the courts or the Department of Labor will look at all the facts and surrounding circumstances of each scenario to determine who is and is not an independent contractor. And it focuses on seven factors, and some of those factors include the worker's opportunity for profit or loss, depending on managerial skill, the investments made by a worker or the employer, the degree of permanence of the work relationship, nature and degree of control exerted by the employer, the extent to which the work performed is an integral part of the employer's business, and the worker's skill and initiative. And then we have a catch-all factor there for any and all other additional factors. The crux of the whole test really though is we're looking at the reality of the economic relationship between the worker and the employer. If the worker is relying on the employer for a paycheck, weekly, bi-weekly, whatever it might be, they're probably an employee. If the worker is able to make money elsewhere because they have other clients that are paying them, other jobs that they're doing, then they're probably an independent contractor. So that's the way you're looking at it there is what is the economic reality of the relationship between the parties? And then under Ohio law, I talked about the Ohio tort law, and this is important because if you have an employee that acts as your agent and they do something wrong, you as the principal or the employer are going to be responsible for their actions. And so Ohio uses that right to control test. And it's an eight factor test that focuses mainly on whether the employer had the right to control the manner or the means of the work performed, or they actually exerted that control. So it doesn't necessarily mean that an employer actually controlled the manner and means of the work performed, just that they have that right, that ability to and so what this does is it you want to make sure that the person working on your farm 
Are they going to be covered by insurance if an accident happens? And that's the important distinction between independent contractor and employee as well, is whether or not the independent contractor has insurance, if their insurance is going to cover any accidents or damage that happens on the property, on the farm, to individuals, or is that going to be something that you as the employer are going to be responsible for? And if you misclassify, you might not be thinking, oh, I'm not going to be responsible because they're an independent contractor. Well, the courts could find that actually they're an employee and that your insurance is responsible. And then there is a whole other host of issues in terms of whether or not insurance will actually cover that accident because you misclassified the employee. So, Jeff, those sound like consequences, of course, and misclassifying. So what are additional or more consequences if we do, in fact, misclassify a worker? I don't know if I scared you enough, but... <laughs> yeah, there... you did. <laughs> There are additional scary uh, penalties that are associated with misclassifying a worker as an independent contractor. And one of the big ones is wage law violations. If you misclassify somebody as an independent contractor, you're not paying them a minimum wage potentially. And we'll get into agricultural exemptions to minimum wage and stuff like that. But you could potentially have wage law violations. There are both civil and criminal penalties associated with that. Then you could have the potential of unpaid employment taxes. You have I-9 violations for failing to verify the worker's ability to work in the United States. And those include criminal and civil penalties. You could have penalties for failing to pay state unemployment insurance, violating workers' compensation acts, potential claims for violating the American with Disabilities Act, Family and Medical Leave Act, and other state and federal anti-discrimination laws. So the bottom line really is, Producers cannot afford to misclassify a worker. It, it's one of the most important things I think we can do in the labor and employment realm is to classify, properly classify the workers on our farm. So Jeff, I feel like the biggest step for a business to grow is by hiring that first employee. A business may be able to hire that employee and they'd be like, okay, so I have this employee on my farm. Now what? Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into getting that first employee on the farm. There's all these job description things you have to worry about, whether or not the job description you're posting will encompass everything that the worker will be doing. If not, then you potentially have a claim for unlawful termination if the job description isn't complete or isn't sufficient for what you're looking for. And so say you fire that employee for not performing the job duties that you want, but you didn't put that in the job description, probably an unlawful termination claim there. So there's that aspect of it, the anti-discrimination, the unlawful termination lens that you have to look through when you are going through the hiring process. But when you get that employee on the farm, the first thing you have to do is to determine whether or not you have an agricultural employee. And I think a lot of this has to do with, we have operating farms, but we also have agritourism on some of those farms, right? So what is an agricultural employee? Well, an agricultural employee is involved or engaged in primary or secondary agriculture. And under the Fair Labor Standards Act, primary agriculture is everything that we think of that is traditionally associated with farming. We have the cultivating, the growing, the producing, the harvesting of agricultural or horticultural commodities, raising livestock, poultry, dairying, all that you know, primary agriculture. The one that gets tricky is secondary agriculture. And you can still be an agricultural employee if you're performing work on a farm or by a farmer that is closely related to primary agriculture. And some examples of that include repairing and servicing equipment necessary for farm operations, flying a crop dusting plane, you know, deploying pest control measures in barns, fixing lights and other maintenance work. Where it gets kind of tricky that I've seen in my research, the courts get kind of finicky on processing activities. So when we are on a dairy farm, processing milk is, you know, almost inconsequential. You have to do that because milk has to be processed within so little time. But um, the U.S. Supreme Court had a case where they said that a sugarcane farm that was processing and refining their own sugarcane those employees doing that process were not agricultural employees because the sugarcane farms are not traditionally 
refining and processing their own sugar cane. So you can imagine that operation was huge, right? And they thought they were getting away with having agricultural employees the whole time. So why is it important to distinguish between an agricultural employee and a traditional employee? And that's because there are a lot of exemptions that apply to agricultural employees. And probably the farming industry appreciates the exemptions that are available, but what are those exemptions for agricultural employees? Yeah, and just a little background on Fair Labor Standards Act, which also controls youth labor and wage and hour. So back in the day when it wasn't regulated, people were taking advantage of youth labor, of individuals working in factories and stuff like that. So these laws were put in place to protect the American worker. And so they realized when they were making these laws that agriculture could not sustain the, the increase in minimum wage. They know that agriculture is a, a lean industry. And so they gave those exemptions for overtime pay and minimum wage requirements to agricultural producers so that the agricultural producers can find some sort of way to make a profit and be sustainable in order to feed the world, right? One question too, are those exemptions potentially vulnerable? Are they in discussion? Are those exemptions going to be questioned as we consider those issues in, in society? I think there is a certain sector that probably would push for removing these agricultural exemptions. And again, the federal law reigns supreme until it doesn't. So we have states that I believe it's Washington and, and Oregon might have done something like this, where they are implementing a minimum wage for agricultural employees or requiring that employees receive overtime pay. So the FLSA exempts certain agricultural producers under a certain limit, usually your small and medium-sized operations, from paying minimum wage. But the FLSA exempts all agricultural labor from overtime provisions. But some states are doing away with that. So there is some possibility out there that Ohio could pass a law in the future that says you have to pay a minimum wage of this to your agricultural labor and you have to pay overtime rates after 40 hours a week. Now, Jeff, what if I have an employee that's employed on my operation but they do both agricultural and non-agricultural work in the same work week. Is there anything special I have to do for that? Yeah. So like I said, this is, I see this a lot potentially happening on those operating farms that have both agricultural work to be done and then non-agricultural work. And let's think of like an agritourism operation where you're driving a tractor for a tour around the farm, or you're working a booth on the farm selling produce whatever it might be, doing an educational program on the farm, something like that is not going to be considered agricultural labor. So if you have an employee that does both, you know, say harvesting crop and putting on an educational program for your agritourism operation, and they do that in the same work week, well, that worker actually loses their agricultural exemption status. And so you have to pay them a minimum wage. You have to abide by overtime requirements. And so it's important that you separate the work. If you can separate the work into different weeks, so for this week, this employee has been focused on nothing but agricultural labor, you get that exemptions for that employee. But if the next week they're doing some non-agricultural work, then you have to pay them by you know your state or federal minimum wage, whichever one's better, and your overtime requirements. So Jeff, one of your expertise areas is our taxes. And so the tax obligations, what are my tax obligations for an employee versus an independent contractor? Yeah. And we touched on this a little bit in the beginning and that when you hire an employee, you're going to have more compliance issues and more regulations to follow than you would with an independent contractor. With the independent contractor, you want your independent contractor to fill out a W-9 that gives you all their information for tax purposes. And as the law stands right now, if you pay your independent contractor $600 or more, you have to file a 1099 with the IRS and provide a copy of that 1099 to the independent contractor by January 31st of the next year. That lets the IRS know that, okay, this is your business expense that you've had, and we need to know that this person, this independent contractor, is also going to claim on their taxes the amount of money you've paid them. 
when you have an employee, you enter into the realm of federal tax withholding. And for federal purposes, you as an employer are going to withhold and pay some Social Security and Medicare taxes. You're going to withhold federal income tax. Agricultural employers could potentially be responsible for the Federal Unemployment Tax Act or the FUDA tax. I believe that's after $20,000 has been paid in a calendar quarter in this year or the preceding year, or there were 10 or more employees in a single day for 20 weeks in the current year or previous year. So it gets into those larger operations. We'll be responsible for the unemployment tax, but you'll be responsible for those four taxes primarily. And then you should always have your employees fill out a W-4 that provides the information of any withholding exemptions they may have or additional withholding requests that they do have. And then you have Ohio. So Ohio income and school district tax does not have to be withheld by an agricultural employer. That's a nice little exemption in the law for Ohio agricultural employers. But a lot of agricultural employers do willingly withhold Ohio income and school district tax. And that's because you're probably already paying a payroll specialist to withhold your federal stuff. You might as well you know, go ahead and do the Ohio stuff as well. But if you are an agricultural employer and you are not going to withhold Ohio taxes, then you have to have each employee fill out what we call the Ohio IT4, and that's the Employees Withholding Exemption Certificate. And they have to mark the box that says, I am exempt from Ohio withholding under revised code 5747.06A1 through 6. And it's under section three of that form. But if you do not have this exemption certificate filled out, then you have to withhold Ohio taxes. So an agricultural employer that does not want to withhold Ohio taxes has to fill that out. And then we get into the Ohio unemployment insurance tax, which again, just like the federal unemployment insurance tax, an employer, an agricultural employer does not have to worry about until they reach a certain threshold. Usually as you get into your larger operation, that's when you want to start worrying about whether or not you are subject to that unemployment insurance tax. And then workers' compensation. Although it's technically not a tax, it is a fee that you have to pay, you have to get coverage if you have at least one employee. And this goes for all employers across the state of Ohio, regardless of agriculture or non-agriculture. If you have one employee on the farm, you have to have workers' compensation coverage. So Jeff, I know that producers probably are not doing this at all, but what about when someone gets paid just cash, cash under the table, they try not to report it. What typically happens when producers pay cash? What are some risks that they are associating themselves with? That's what all the producers are doing it. I mean, we all know they are. And that's kind of what I want to point across is you're risking house and home for doing it the wrong way. And the Department of Labor has hired a lot of new investigators to make sure that people are complying with wage and hour and employment laws. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that a producer is going to be caught not following the law. And so if I, in fact, need a lot of short-term labor on the farm, the independent contractor could be the way to go. I just need to follow through on the 1099 at the end of the year. Is there any other reason that would not work? I think, and that's a big misconception, is that we have seasonal labor, right? And that's going to be 1099 because they're not continuous with the, the operation. But agriculture generally is seasonal. And so having seasonal employees is just that. They're still employees. So we got to be careful being like, oh, I just need seasonal help. They're going to be 1099. No, they're going to be seasonal employees Uh and you have to withhold those taxes. You have to do that kind of stuff. Now, there are certain limits. Like if an employee doesn't make over so much money, they don't have to file federal income tax. Right. And, you know, you get that a lot with your young teenagers. But you go into paying somebody for 40 hours a week for three months, 12 weeks, whatever that is, you're over that threshold. And if you're classifying them as an independent contractor and not withholding income tax and are the individuals that you're hiring seasonally. Are they paying self-employment tax? Are they covering that Social Security and Medicare tax that you have to cover? So that's the other way to look at it is that the people that you're hiring aren't doing the self-employment things that they should be doing as well. They're just taking that money and just saying, thanks for the paycheck. And they're not fine. So. Man, you love being the bad guy, don't you? 
I do. It's actually one of my favorite parts of the job. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like you're just trying to keep people out of trouble because the worst case scenario, there are consequences. And that's, you know, why we have jobs as attorneys. It's to prevent the worst case scenario from happening. And you see it all the time with people that you talk to, even on, you know, a regular business operation, not even an agricultural operation. They're doing things as an attorney. If you know a little bit about the law, you're scratching your head and being like, we should probably talk about that because you could be sued. You could be going to jail for your practices. And so there are a few people that I've met and talked to that that's the exact scenario there. And it's not going to be out of the norm in agriculture industry either, where people think that they're innocently avoiding the law or intentionally avoiding, you know, the compliance headache, but that could really cost them. And you'd be out of a job and out of income or not spending the extra time or the little extra money to do it right from the beginning. So let's say two uh, high school buddies go together and they start bailing straw and hay all summer long and they own the equipment and they are locating the farmland, but they need some help unloading straw wagons when it's July 10th and all the straw's coming off. Should that labor be employee? Yeah, I'm going to say that's probably an employee situation. You're controlling the manner, the time when they work. It's not uh -huh. that the employee can go on to the job whenever they want and finish the job whenever they want. As you know, that employer, you're like, we need to get this done now. We got other things we need to get done. And you might pay them by the project, probably by the hour. That's something to look at too. And whether or not you want to call it independent contractor, that person is probably going to be considered an employee. Even if it's for three days, five days, however long, it can be really short. It can be a definite term of employment, but they're definitely an employee. If the two buddies are the bosses, that means the other workers are employees. Yeah, most definitely. And you think about it all the time. I mean, in Ohio, we have at-will employment. So somebody could come on as you know an employee and leave after a day because they just don't like the work or they don't like their bosses or, or whatever it might be. But that one day, that person is still considered an employee, even though they were there for a short period of time. So what about the farm manager that spent $2,400 in cash? How are they deducting that $2,400 as a business expense on their tax return at the end of the year? Miscellaneous? Or wouldn't they want to deduct that $2,400 as a, a business expense? Right. And that's where you get into the legal compliance issue, right? So if you say that that $2,400 was for labor or something like that. Custom hire. Custom hire. Did you provide that 1099? Do uh, you do all that kind of stuff? And so that's where this under the cash, under the table, cash payments has you know come into play. And if somebody finds out about that, then you're in all those legal issues that arise, your unpaid taxes, your issues with complying with either the 1099 rules or an employee labor law rules. So you're risking it double there. Jeff, I feel like we just scratched the surface of this topic. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? There is so much more. We could go hours and hours about this. But I will say that if you visit farmoffice.osu.edu, we do have some resources available already for labor and employment. But keep on the lookout. We are going to be releasing an employment law handbook for agricultural producers. Something that I think we should all be aware of too is youth labor on the farm and the regulations that follow that. So I do know that we have that resource available, the Ag Law Library on farmoffice.osu.edu. And if you have any questions, you can email me, lewis.1459 at osu.edu, and I can do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thanks for listening today. For more information about farm management tips, be sure to check out the farm office at farmoffice.osu.edu. Hey, podcasters. Do you like what you're hearing? Be sure to like and subscribe to get notifications when our episodes go live. Share us with your friends, your neighbors, maybe even that third cousin on Facebook that you haven't talked to for years. Let Bruce and I know what you think, maybe even future topics by writing us a review. With that, we'll see you next time.